middle of your holidays. So we appreciate very much you joining us today. And I'll shut up now. It's uh, your call, my dear York. Thank you so much for okay. accepting. Thank you. Thank you, my dear friend Juan Pablo Guerrero. First, I must congratulate Gift on the 10th anniversary. This is a great, a great accomplishment. Uh, congratulations and applause for Juan Pablo Guerrero and the whole team. Uh, I'm really glad that I'm your friend and uh, that I was able to work for you for all those years, practically almost from the beginning. <laughs> we made many great moments together. Uh, and yes, uh, I will be a kind of host uh, for, for this meeting to, to all of you today. Uh, we're going to speak about the importance of independence of Supreme Audit Institutions, so-called SAIS. And uh, we will start uh, with a brief presentation, uh, 10 minutes, that will be given by Benjamin uh, Fuentes from the uh, IDI. Uh, he, he will present us uh, with, with the, the, the standards uh, that were part of the, the declarations, first of, uh, of Lima and then later of the Declaration of Mexico. It's uh, going to be Marte. Marte Brissette. Okay, good. Okay, thank you for this correction. Thank you for this correction. And uh, later on, we will have um, uh, reactors. Uh, Claire Schouten from International Budget Partnership. Uh, Francisco Rodriguez. Uh, Amy o um, uh, That's Edwards. actually Jua King um, is from ASI, not yet. Oh. Sorry, George. Uh, Last minute program changes. changes. Okay, no problem. Okay, we will have reactors. Yeah. Uh, they will introduce themselves. But uh, I believe that Jan van Schalke uh, from the South o Africa Court of Audit is one of them. I salute my dear friend uh, very warmly. Nice to have you here with us as well. And later on, we will have an uh, interactive discussion uh, before we start the directors. And later on, before we start the, the discussions, uh, I, I will give you a couple of questions uh, as a start. Uh, so to have it in mind, what, what is in, in which direction we are expecting to have the, uh, the discussion to be, to be developing. So uh, that, that's briefly uh, from, from, from my side uh, as a starting point. So now we will start with the presentation from the IDI. And uh, yes, my friends, uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Are you able to see my presentation? Yes, Marta, it's great. We can see it. OK, great. Thank you, and good afternoon everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My, my name is Marta Briside from the InterSci Development Initiative. And I will say a few words uh, about what we do to support SCI independence and also um, present key principles of SCI independence and the development of independent uh, Supreme Audit Institutions. So to start, the InterSci Development Initiative is a not-for-profit autonomous implementing body uh, which supports supreme audit institutions in developing countries to be effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions. And we have four strategic priorities that are organized around work streams, and they include uh, well-governed supreme audit institutions, which includes support to um, strategic planning, risk management, um, and general governance. Professional size is support to size in uh, implementing the ISIs, the International Standards for Supreme uh, Audit Institutions. Um, and uh, relevant size, which focuses on innovation and technology, and also being relevant in terms of um, support to auditing the sustainable development goals, and most recently also to auditing the transparency, accountability, and inclusiveness of COVID-19 emergency funding. And of course, independent size is a very high prioritized work stream. And I'll come back to what we do specifically later in the presentation. 
But firstly, why is psi independence important? Or, or first of all, what is a psi? Uh, it is a public oversight institution that audits the government's use of public funds. And independence is a critical prerequisite for any psi to carry out its mandate effectively and to perform its role as an agent of accountability. Being independent from the agencies that they audit is important in order to, to provide unbiased information um, and an independent opinion on the way public resources are managed. And of course, it's important to, to uh, create the trust in the integrity of the management of public resources. So what can uh, independent size do? They can provide a very relevant contribution to uh, fiscal transparency by providing information on how governments, uh, on government's budget execution and, and use of public resources through published audits. They can contribute to accountability by making governments answer to the findings of audit reports. But of course, this uh, relies on a, an effective cooperation also with parliaments and also the response by the executive. Um, by making audit reports available in the public domain, size can contribute to public participation and citizen empower empowerment, which is another important accountability function. And through their role in performing compliance audits, and they assess governments, um, how governments should abide to rules and regulations, hence um, assessing rule of law, as well as effectiveness and efficiency of governments by uh, conducting performance audits. And they can also have an important role in deterring and also detecting uh, corrupt practices, while the mandates, of course, vary uh, for different size and the extent to which they can investigate this. So what does it mean to be independent? Um, in InterSci, we um, refer to two key documents. And uh, the first one is the Lima Declaration, which, was, uh, is, which is from 1977, which is really the uh, Magna Carta, so to speak, for, for InterSci, as it lays out the key principles of public auditing. And these principles uh, have also been recognized by the UN and independence is also uh, mentioned here as a very critical precondition for, for size to be able to, uh, to perform uh, on their mandate. So um, in uh, 2007, we have the, the Mexico Declaration, which expands on these principles uh, or on the principle of independence and, and establishes the eight principles. Um, and these are, are sort of the benchmark against which we assess independence of Supreme Audit institutions. Um, I'll go quickly through them uh, if I have time, as these are important. Um, the first is the existence of an appropriate and effective legal framework, and also the de facto application of provisions of this framework. Um, secondly, um, the independence of heads of size, uh, including the security of tenure and legal immunity in the normal discharge of their duties. Um, thirdly, size need to have a sufficiently broad mandate and full discretion in the discharge of their functions. Unrestricted restricted access to information is key. The right, but also the obligation to report on their work and the freedom to decide, decide the content and timing of audit reports and to publish and disseminate them. Then we have um, the existence of effective follow-up mechanisms on SI recommendations. And finally, financial and administrative autonomy and the available, availability of resources. So um, as you can see, this is very much in line with the gift principle nine, uh, which also um, emphasizes the legal uh, independence and the mandate and the access to information and of course the appropriate resources to be able to audit and report uh, on public funds. Uh, interestingly, uh, it also uh, emphasizes um, that size should operate in an independent accountability and transparent manner, which I think is, is good. 
uh, in the sense that uh, there are also expectations to size that uh, uh, independence is not only granted in a sense, but also something that uh, must be earned. But of course, this is, uh, this is independence in, in principle. Uh, but looking at the reality, uh, we see that many size um, face challenges in their operational and financial independence. Um, we see that uh, there is uh, interference in the budget from the executive. And we also see that size fa uh, face or heads of size face reduced protection from protection from unjust removal. And also access to information is a problem. And um, these are trends that we've been seeing for a long time. This is data based on um, primarily from, from, from a size stock taking global report from 2017. And soon we will be launching a, a report uh, from the recent years um, that will uh, provide up to date information on this. We are also doing an assessment on how the, the global pandemic may have impacted on sci independence. And that's also um, something that will, a report that will be coming out uh, later in the fall. <clears throat> so uh, I wanted to dwell a little bit on the principle of um, financial independence, as this might be the, uh, will be the, the topic uh, partly of, of this session. So the, the Mexico Declaration notes that size should have available necessary and uh, reasonable human material and monetary resources. Of course, this is, is uh, fundamental for size really to, to perform on their mandate. So it's a, it's a, a key to, to all other aspects of, of uh, independence really. It also says that the executive should not control or direct the access to these resources, that size should manage their own budget and allocate it appropriately, and that the legislature uh, ultimately is responsible for ensuring that size have proper resources to fulfill their mandates, and that size can also appeal uh, to the legislature if resources are insufficient. But of course, we know that there are many models in, in practice. And so we look forward to hearing from some of the participants here today on how they uh, manage uh, their financial independence. Uh, lastly, just two words on what we do. Uh, as I mentioned, Sci Independence is uh, a, a key priority for IDI. Uh, we uh, work um, on global advocacy and partnerships. I engage with the International Budget Partnership as a partner. We're very pleased also to uh, be here at the gift meeting and to, and to engage with your uh, many stewards and use this as a platform to, to promote sci independence. We promote or we give targeted support to size and to sci leaders on independence, which can include legal support. And we also have a, a, a mechanism called the Sci Independence Rapid Advocacy Mechanism, which is basically a hotline uh, for uh, size or other stakeholders to report threats to their independence. And uh, the team at IDI will make an assessment of these cases and uh, decide on an appropriate uh, advocacy response and long-term support. We, uh, we create knowledge, we disseminate knowledge, and we have a, a resource center called the Sci Independence Resource Center where, where hopefully more or less everything that you can, that has been published on Sci Independence is gathered and can be found. So I welcome you to visit that and to visit us at uh, our website. So with that, um, thank you. And I look forward to the discussions. Uh, so thank you, Marta, for for this uh, excellent presentation on the core principles of, of the size. Uh, and now um, I, I will invite the the responders who are going to be Claire Schouten from International Budget Partnership, Joaquin Caprulo from Argentina, Amy Edwards from United States Treasury. Uh, Sheila Tipe from South Africa National Treasury, 
Jan van Schalke from the Office of Auditor General of the South Africa, and maybe Ekaterine Wundsade uh, of the National Gula of, of Georgia, uh, Minister of Finance. And uh, I would like to focus, uh, to, to invite all, all the responders to, to focus on, on the following questions. Uh, what, what are the benefits uh, of an independent SAI? Uh, how should different actors advocate for SAI independence? What are appropriate mechanisms for a SAI to attain financial independence? And what are the main obstacles? And the fourth question is, what are the outcomes that you expect from the SAI to ensure knowing them with appropriate resources to audit? Financial benefits, non-financial benefits, and impacts on recommendations. So please, uh, Claire, uh, the floor is yours. Great, thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be with you all today, as always, with uh, the GIFT community and, and uh, our partners, IDI, and, and many of the colleagues here today. So great to see you all. Uh, a very important question here about SAI independence. And, and we think that a robust audit system is, is critical for ensuring public funds serve their intended objectives. And SAIs, their checking and the reporting on the use of public funds is instrumental in the pandemic response and recovery as well as the sustainable development goals. We've noted that while essential for accountable governments, SAIs often face serious limitations in many countries as, as we've already heard today. Uh, as the open budget survey shows, and the survey is based on, on the principles that we've been hearing today and international good practices, we've seen that audit reports are withheld from the public, hearings on audit findings take place behind closed doors, and findings are not acted upon. We've conducted a joint report with the Interside Development Initiative, IDI, and again, still see that many countries are suffering from long-standing obstacles that ultimately limit oversight, just as we need to ensure that vulnerable groups are protected and pandemic-related relief reaches those who need it most. Our recent analysis of how 120 governments managed their initial COVID-19 fiscal policy emergency responses show that in only about a quarter of countries were auditors able to produce and publish audit reports on COVID fiscal packages before the end of 2020. And we might hear some more of those examples today. So it's increasingly clear that for SAI's work to deliver impact, the support and collaboration of an ecosystem of interconnected actors and conditions and processes are, are needed. So we see such an ecosystem should include at least six integral components. First, an institutional framework or the mandate is needed to ensure public auditors are truly independent, as we've been discussing, and have the resources to do their job. Secondly, auditors must produce high quality audit reports that cover essential programs and are accessible to the public. Third, effective legislative oversight is required to audit reports, uh, to respond to audit reports in a timely manner. Fourth, we see that executives must address audit findings on, and to act on audit recommendations. Fifth, there should be independent follow-up, usually by the audit office or the legislature to assess whether recommendations were effectively implemented. And finally, the public, including civil society organizations, the media and citizens must have the opportunity to engage, influence and bolster the entire audit and oversight process. So we believe that civil society are crucial allies of SAIs in these times. So just in the past year, when the independence of SAIs in countries such as Cyprus, Ghana, and Myanmar was threatened by powerful executives, its non-state actors, including civic groups in the media, rushed to defend the SAIs. Civic groups can also help the SAIs draw attention to issues of public concern. For example, in South Africa, we may hear more about this as well, the results from social audits of water and sanitation services conducted by local civic groups and townships have helped the SAI to prioritize issues that merit further investigation in their audit program. We've seen that the IBP through our audit accountability initiative, and, and this is work uh, that we've done with many colleagues in the room today, we have learned important lessons in countries such as Argentina, Nepal, and Sierra Leone of how SAI civil society collaborations can enhance government responsiveness. And they point to the helpful role that civil society can play in amplifying audit recommendations, through the media, providing complementary analysis and evidence, 
engaging a wide range of government actors without being beholden to the formal oversight table and building grassroots support and bottom up pressure to address audit recommendations. So we believe that ultimately to strengthen the audit and oversight ecosystem, we need all hands on deck. We all have a role to play that goes to the heart of the work of, of GIFT. We urge SAIs to make every effort to publish their audit findings in a timely and accessible manner and, and to create meaningful and inclusive mechanisms for civic engagement. This could be achieved by working with civil society groups to improve audit targeting, expand coverage, and enhance capacity, of course, in collaboration with IDI and others. Legislatures can proactively review and follow up on audit reports and hold public hearings in which they seek testimony from SAIs and relevant members of the public. They should also initiate processes to ensure that SAIs have the mandate and the independence of resources to conduct and publish relevant audits. Civil society can champion the independence of SAIs and call out governments when independence is threatened. We've seen this in Ghana, for example, when the recent auditor general was put on permanent leave, more than about 300 civil society organizations mobilized to call for the independence of the SAI. And they can engage with SAIs on priority and high risk areas for audit, promote the visibility of audits and, and track and advocate for the executive follow-up. And finally, development partners can explore opportunities for cross-sectoral support for all institutions involving that accountability ecosystem. And certainly the executive has a role to play to ensure that information is available to auditors. We know this has been a big challenge in the time of COVID and to heed and take appropriate action on audit findings. And senior officials should make clear that the audit findings must be taken seriously. And we have seen great examples in Zambia, South Africa of such cases. Ultimately with our partners around the world and we'll hear from them today, we're excited to engage with SAIs. We're also very excited about the transparency and accountability and inclusiveness audits that SAIs are conducting around the world and, and look forward to engaging more in those processes as well. So thanks so much. Thank you very much, Claire. Thank you very much for all, 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 all the remarks. And now please, Mr. Jacqueline Caprula, uh, the, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you very much, George. I'm, I'm really pleased to be here and thank you uh, for the invitation. I'm seeing so many colleagues who have been working in the in the recent past, like Claire and uh, Juan Pablo, particularly who have been from IBB and he's very supportive of, of the job that I see he's doing in Argentina. For those who don't know about uh, our our job in Argentina, I see is a civil society organization. It's a human rights organization who advocates for the rights of the most disadvantaged groups in our country, uh, but also for a strong democracy that gives voice to, to those who are uh, who suffer the inequalities in, 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 the, in the worst in the worst way. Um, and from this perspective, we have been working for the last 10 or 15 years on how Supreme Art institutions can be a key actor of societies who are more inclusive, who are more accountable, but also who are more respectful of human rights and who guarantee their citizenship to be um, more, more equal and who have uh, equal rights in terms of uh, public participation. Of course, most of what I'm going to say right now is very connected to our experience in Argentina, but also in Latin America. We are an active uh, organization with the OLSF, like the, the regional organization for the Supreme Audit Institutions in, in, in our region. And it's very connected to one of our key agendas that is to promote public participation within uh, SAIs. And in the last few decades, we have seen that in, in, in the region at least, we have been moving from, a, from an approach to independence that was very connected to this mandate on Supreme Audit Institution that was very linked to their role as um, fiscal monitoring uh, organization institutions more dedicated to determining mismanagement of resources and not so much connected with the quality uh, and, the, uh, and the human rights perspective and the, and the gender perspective of public policies. And that is why we have been working maybe sometimes more successfully and sometimes not so much to transform not only these institutions from their constitutional mandate, their legal mandate, 
to become institutions more connected to what I was just saying about uh, the human rights approach in, in, in public policies, the implementation of SDGs and, and, and so on. Uh, but also from a practical perspective. And we believe in the sense that independence should not only be that every, every of these two models has, has a, a different approach to independence. If we want to promote institutions to be more active in promoting public participation and human rights, we need to expect uh, supremacy institutions to be more open, not only to the citizenship, but also to the rest of public institutions. And that is something that when we talk to uh, authorities and public officials within supremacy institutions, something that frightens them and, and is kind of stressing at some point because they're really reluctant not, not everyone, of course, would have great allies in, in, in many supremacy institutions. They're very reluctant sometimes to understand that this dialogue with other institutions and civil society could be beneficial uh, for, their, for their work. But of course, that being more open and being more influenced by this, uh, by this input from external actors is definitely a challenge regarding independence. That is why we try to focus on two main pillars of, of, of the independence of the, of the of supreme art institutions to avoid them from being affected from these new kinds of interactions. The first one is to guarantee that the authorities, their authorities are the people uh, which are politically independent, who have the technical ability to lead institutions of this kind and who have been elected through open processes where the community could participate. And so we can guarantee that this new authority, even though if it is one authority, it depends on the institutional design of the institution, of the particular institution, sorry. Uh, if this person has also a profile that is suitable to pursue the kind of goals we expect a Supreme Art Institution, public institution to to follow. That also involves um, a guarantee that they, they won't be removed uh, arbitrarily by the rest of the, of the branches, something that does not always happen, at least in, in Latin America. And I think the second pillar is definitely the one connected with the, with the resources. Of course, that if we want independent supremacy institutions that can uh, dialogue with civil society, we, we need them to have the resources they need to conduct their, their, their activities and that those resources are not being affected or determined discretionally by the executive or even the legislature. And I think that in this way, we should try to see the whole uh, budget cycle to determine uh, what we can do at every of its stages to strengthen the fiscal independence of supreme private institutions. And, and I'm, I'm gonna talk maybe from the Argentinian experience because the one I know the most, but in Argentina, the, the supreme art institution has the, the capacity, the legal capacity to determine what its resources are gonna be for the following period and send it to the executive who is the one in charge of gathering of the, the request of resources for the upcoming, uh, upcoming budget for the next year and sending the bill to the Congress. We need, of course, to uh, guarantee that to remember to just have the ability to determine the resources. And in that way, in that, in that, at that stage, it's also key that civil society can help to legitimate the calculation of resources every institution is doing because of course this is going to be very connected to the legal and constitutional mandate they have, but also with the expectations that civil society organizations have towards the activity of supreme Art institutions. Second one, we need to, to guarantee that the executives are not going to won't have the, the capacity to alter or modify what the supreme Art institutions are requesting and sending it as, it, as uh, exactly as it came from the supreme Art institutions to the Congress. And also, and, and, and the third stage is to guarantee that during the debate in the legislature, we 
we yes guarantee as well that supreme institutions are going to be listened during the debate of the of the budget law for the upcoming period but also civil society and and finally and i'm going to end with with this with this idea the final stage of the of the budget cycle the one meaning the distribution of resources has also shown to be very critical regarding the independence of of supreme audit institutions mainly because that is a role that in most countries is played by the executive branches who uh, receive the resources uh, from taxes and after the uh, budget law is passed are the ones who are distributing the, the money basically to the different institutions and we have seen in the past that this mechanism sometimes if it is not very clear about the moments that this distribution should happen could also be a mechanism of pressure toward supreme audit institutions meaning that they are not uh, they are distributing the money in, in small portions or maybe delaying the, the distribution of resources for supreme audit institutions. So I think that we should, as, as a conclusion, to see uh, fiscal um, independence of supreme audit institutions from this perspective, always having in mind their role as key actors in promoting human rights in our countries and also the interaction with civil society organizations. And I think we have many challenges that should be analyze towards the whole uh, budget cycle, which will allow us to determine which are the best ways or paths to protect that uh, supreme audit institutions are fully independent in, in, in any sense. Uh, that's it, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Joaquin. Uh, uh, yes, I, I agree with you 100%. Uh, you stressed out all the, mo the most um, important things. Uh, the integrity of the people that work for the Supreme Audit institutions, their complete independence, political independence, economical independence, the fiscal independence of, of the institution and uh, the, the, the process, uh, which are the main, uh, the most important points in this financial process of, of budgetary cycle. And the third thing that I find very, very uh, important is uh, the point you made about the participation of the public. Uh, if you follow through the years, uh, the reports of uh, IBP, International Budget Partnerships, uh, who is focusing on budget principles, uh, budget cycles, uh, they used a very uh, nice expression about this participation of public. Uh, we made a lot of effort uh, with, with my friend Juan Pablo about the participatory budgeting. And uh, they used the same term um, for, for the auditing. They speak about the participatory uh, auditing, which basically mean that the Supreme Audit institutions should organize the process of, of, of planning of their work uh, through a strong, uh, strong connection and uh, expression of minds uh, uh, with the public. But as you said, uh, it, it is still important to have the independent approach. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the process should be there, the ideas should flow, but it should be at the end of the day, the, the final decision should be on the independent institutions, which ideas should come through and which, which are going to be postponed or maybe even rejected. Uh, but now uh, le let me give floor to, to Amy Edwards uh, from uh, the United States. Uh, uh, th the floor is yours, please. Great. Good, good, uh, good morning here from the United States, um, and I'm glad to be with you all today. Um, I think I was I was asked to help speak to um, you know what we've seen from from the U.S. experience as it relates to the Supreme Audit and you know institutions, and um, I, I can report that I, I believe that the Government Accountability Office is sort of our uh, SAI and. Um, that our, our GAO, our Government Accountability Office is celebrating its 100th year anniversary this year. And so um, I am not, I, I am, my job at the US Treasury is to oversee 
uh, our government-wide financial reporting for the whole government. So um, trillions of dollars of, uh, of funds a year that we are collecting from um, our public and then reporting how all of those funds are used um, on behalf of our, our citizens and our public. So um, that's my role at the US Treasury. So we have a government-wide financial report and statement and also other digital reporting um, on, on, our, um, on our expenditures through our USA spending platform, which I, I think I've discussed with this group before. So I oversee all of those reporting elements and all of those are audited um, by our uh, government accountability office. And um, I, I wanna echo some of the points. Um, you know, so I am, I am the person who is audited. I am not the auditor, um, but I, I think that I see obviously such a tremendous value in that independent auditor. And you know, thankfully in the US, we, we have a hundred years of legacy of, of, of having that independent role for the audit. Um, and I think that is just so critical. It's critical to our democracy. It's critical to, um, you know, our sound economic principles that we have in the U.S. Um, those audits are so important. And also, you know, it's really important for the trust and, uh, you know, for our government as a whole. So I think that's this. Thankfully, we, we've had this legacy. And I would say that the the independence is key. Um, not not only is it it's, it's outside of our executive branch of government. Our audit group, the, the GAO, is in the legislative branch of our government, so it's not controlled by the executive. So it's seen as it truly is an, a separate branch of our government. And they're also, I think, one one note that is really important in the U.S. is they are seen as non political. They're not partisan. Um, they're not working for one party. Um, they're very truly independent. And so I think I am currently at the U.S. Treasury, but before I came to the U.S. Treasury, I was in the United States Senate in our legislative branch. And I also could rely in, in both of my roles. I know that the, our audit institution, GAO, provides nonpartisan, very independent, fact-based uh, analysis, research, and audits that are just so critical in order to inform decision making. And so um, in, in all of my roles in our government in the US, uh, whether I was in the legislative branch and I work really closely with our, with our GAO, uh, and now as someone who gets audited regularly, I, I just wanna stress how and, and echo the points that others have raised here today on how critical this is from a management perspective as well. Um, and um, you know, I, I thought I would share just a little bit about my experience and some of how we use these audits to really drive improvements um, and, you know, obviously the integrity and the, and the accountability, all very critical, but I also, you know, these are very, I get valuable information from our audit partners that help me improve our work, improve the quality of our data, and, and hopefully the, <laughs> what we really want is to improve the mission and outcomes that we provide to our public. So I think all of this is very important to that. So let me just hit on a few things. Um, you know, I mentioned that, that, that our government accountability office, we work very closely with them. Um, we've been auditing, um, you know, for about 30 years, you know, our financial statements in, in the U.S. government. And what, what has really been important, not only do we get the audit report and we get all of the recommendations included, but then we develop very complex uh, uh, remediation plans for how we're going to act on the findings from our audit partners. And I think that's really important. Not only do we get the findings, but then how are we going to address them? How are we gonna to work towards the improvements so that we uh, will eliminate those findings and those recommendations and can move on and continue to improve? I just think that the audit information that we get is critical to that continuous improvement. Even after a hundred years of always, you know, we, we still have a lot of growth and improvement uh, that we're working on every day in our government. And, and I'm sure all of you are as well. Um, and so, um, you know, those remediation plans that we develop include things like root cause identification. What is the real root cause of some of the problems identified? Um, in the, these plans that we have include strategies to actually address the finding. How are we going to tackle it? What's the root cause? Is this an internal control issue? How do we address it? Um, we identify risks. What are the risks um, that are presented by the finding? What are the risks to actually implementing change so we can be very open and accountable? We discuss these remediation plans with our auditors 
So it's not, you know, we, we share this with them. We say, this is what we're going to do within the time frame to address the findings you've identified so that we can take action on them. We also identify an official who's responsible for remediating a certain action. So, so you know, who's going to take some action um, to, to deliver the improvements in this area and address the findings that the auditors have identified. So I think that's really important. And then we develop very detailed timelines and milestones for how we're going to resolve the audit findings so that um, you know, we are providing all of that information uh, you know, open. We work closely with our auditors. We tell them what we're doing. We get their input on it to help us um, you know, make sure that we've understood their findings and recommendations in the best way. And I think that's really important, you know, having that um, partnership. You know, um, one of the other things that we've done in the, in the United States is um, we have something called, um, and it's been around for many decades as well, a joint financial management improvement program. And this, this, this effort brings together the leadership of our, um, our government accountability office, so our auditors, and the management senior leadership. So this is senior officials from the most senior officials from the Department of the Treasury, our executive office of the president, um, the executive branch um, from our office in management and budget. And also brings together um, uh, people who uh, there are senior officials who oversee personnel management because having the right personnel uh, and the right policies um, and really we all get together, um, you know, usually quarterly basis or, you know, at least twice a year or so um, it's fluctuated over time, but we get together to make sure that we are aligned on our goals that we're trying to achieve for our government and work together on key initiatives like how we explore technology. How are we going to make big improvements and change to ensure that we are maintaining the accountability, transparency, and all of um, the improvements that we want to see over time? So we're continuously improving. And so making sure leadership get together to talk about and having goals around what you want to achieve, um, working it, you know, obviously they're independent, you know, they've got a role to play. We've got a role to play to execute, but we all have that shared goal of improving our operations and ensuring the integrity of uh, the work that we do and the accountability on behalf of our taxpayers and the public. And so we have that shared goal and those shared principles. And it really, I believe, is quite powerful. And I, I would, you know, I think that independence is there, but you can also work together around, we all do have the same goals, even though they have a different role in executing that and 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 than I do. So I think, I just think that we've we've got a good partnership. And and even though I, I do get audited and and um Sometimes that's burdensome and sometimes there's, you know, ups and downs with that, but overall it is um, really critically important. And so I wanted to make sure I got that message out today. Um, I can share a couple of examples uh, from recent years. You know, we've had, um, we've had a, a, you know, a longstanding financial reporting, but in recent years, we've been doing a lot of digital reporting and new reporting and open data. And all of that information has recently gone through audit. And we've seen tremendous improvements in the quality of that data because of the audits that have been conducted. Um, you know, you know, 30% increases in the quality of the awards of over a two year period. So, I mean, just tremendous improvements that we've been able to see in the data. And then, you know, if the data is high quality and we can show that we have an independent evidence of that, then that makes the data much more valuable and useful. So I just um, would encourage, you know, others here that I know, um, it, you know, going down this path and, and um, being susceptible to all these audits can be, can be challenging, but they pay off because we have a better quality of information, we have higher integrity and accountability. And um, I think the lessons we've seen in the US really have, um, have paid off over time and, and are, are critical. So I don't want to take up too much time from everyone today, but um, you know, hopefully I hit the mark on sharing our experience and how critical um, these audit institutions are to, to ensuring that accountability. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amy, for, for, for your remarks. Uh, it's great to hear uh, about the perfect cooperation of two institutions. Uh, I congratulate <laughs> on both I, I wouldn't institutions say, I would say on that. It, it, it's it's great to hear yeah, that we have <laughs> an is, impact as auditors yeah. on the Minister yeah. of Finance. And I was especially uh, uh, intrigued by this uh, remark of you that you made milestones so that you actually yeah. have a plan uh, that you both agree on and um, 
because here we insist as well that they always prepare a plan, the milestones, the responsible person, and that they present that also in the parliament. So this gives them a kind of uh, obligation to, 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 to stick on that plan. And nevertheless, all, all Supreme Audit institutions can all, always make a follow-up audit so that they actually prove if all those milestones have been met, if all the goals have been met, and um, it gives a new starting point to further cooperation. So thank, thank you very much. And um, our next responder should be Sheila Tipe from South Africa. Are, are, is Sheila with us? Oh, yes, here she is. Thank you very much. Nice to have you. Your Hello. camera was off. I, I was afraid you were yes. not here. Now you, the floor is yours, please. Uh, Sheila, should I share the presentation? I see. Uh, uh, no, it's fine. I think I will just. I don't uh, think people need I to thought see. You, you were you were like, like a responder, or was I? Am I mistaken? No, uh, Sheila, no, no, is no, a that's, that's fine. Um, that's she fine. just had a presentation, and I was asking whether okay. I should share it for her. <laughs> okay, okay. I'll, I'll just read through it, um, and I will follow what the other respondents did. In that, uh, they just were on camera. So you can see my face. Um, anyway, my name is Sheila Tipe. I work for the National Treasury in South Africa. Uh, so the, 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 the auditing space is an island space to me. We work together with the Auditor General and all, but we always uh, see them as uh, uh, the necessary uh, external um, eye to what we do. Uh, so I'm just gonna go through, our, I was asked to speak about the budget process and, and if we consider the Auditor General's role as we um, uh, design and reform and so on. Uh, so I'll, I'll just speak through, uh, I'm not gonna show my slides, but I will just speak through them. Uh, so I'm gonna speak to the institutional arrangements and then ensure that the, and then uh, AXA itself and its autonomy and the role of AG in the implementation of the PFMA, which is the main topic that I was asked to speak to, and then uh, any challenges and opportunities that I see. So in terms of the institutional arrangements, first of all, the National Treasury is established by chapter 13, uh, which is on finance of the constitution of South Africa to prescribe measures to ensure both transparency, expenditure control and expenditure control in each of, of, of the government spheres. Uh, by introducing one, the generally recognized accounting practice. So we have the Office of the Accountant General within the Treasury, uh, then uniform expenditure uh, classifications, which is done by the Budget Office, and the Treasury norms and standards, which is by, done by uh, various uh, divisions within the National Treasury, depending on who, who, where uh, on the stage of the public finance management cycle. Um, so there are various players there. Then the, the treasury is also mandated to enforce these measures. Uh, so we are enabled by the PFMA, uh, the Public Finance Management Act, uh, which articulates among other things, uh, budgetary matters. Uh, so I'm from the budget office, so my focus will be uh, budget. So in terms of the, uh, the Auditor General, they are also a, a, a constitutional institution uh, in a different chapter uh, of the constitution, which is chapter nine. And the chapter nine institutions are established to support and safeguard our constitutional democracy and they enjoy a high level of protection to maintain their independence. Uh, so mainly the AG uh, is mandated to audit uh, and report on the accounts, financial statements and financial management of all government institutions, including the treasury. Uh, and they also have uh, other roles apart from that uh, but that is the, the, the major role that they play. Um, so uh, what makes uh, uh, Auditor General, in actual fact, we call it uh, Auditor General of South Africa, uh, the, SA, the, the SI of South Africa. Uh, what makes them autonomous? Uh, first of all, it's because of the legal framework uh, that establishes them, the chapter nine uh, constitution, 
constitutional institutions that I've spoken to, and also they have an enabling act, uh, which is called the Public Audit Act 25 from 2004, which enables them to function independently of any organ of state, uh, including the national treasury. Secondly, they have the power to raise their own funding by charging an audit fee to the public institutions they audit. So they are not listed in the PFMA. The other public institutions are listed in the PFMA uh, and they receive an allocation uh, from uh, the main budget. Uh, so uh, the Auditor General, along with the uh, Reserve Bank, are not listed uh, as public institutions in the PFMA. Uh, to ensure their independence from uh, the treasury. The, inst the institutional strength and integrity of, the, uh, of AXA, is established, they've established themselves as a very respected, if not feared institution. And there has been no indication that the executive interferes with their work. There's a colleague from AXA, they might see it differently, I don't know, because I have never worked there, but from where I sit at the treasury, I have not seen uh, uh, interference with, with their work. So the integrity, that, that integrity gives them the clout uh, for them to, to be able to independently monitor us from, from externally so that our processes in the PFMA are implemented. So the institutions themselves in South Africa take the AG seriously and are keen to get the audits, uh, uh, clean audits each year. So we speak of the PFMA, but there's also the MFMA, which deals with the local uh, government. So the role is similar for both the PFMA, which takes care of the first two tiers of government, which is the, the central in the, in, in the provincial, uh, and then the local has got its own uh, uh, management act, which is the MFMA, uh, but the Auditor General audits uh, the local authorities as well. So whenever I speak of the PFMA, it applies to the MFMA as well. And then uh, the role of the uh, of ASA in, 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 the, in implementing the PFMA. So the PFMA has got some, has uh, explicit, explicitly uh, um, speaks to uh, some of the roles of the, the Auditor General. For example, uh, in section H2, the audit, it's, it speaks to the Auditor General auditing the consolidated financial statements, which are put together by the National Treasury and they must submit these audit reports, make an audit report and submit them. And then section 16, for example, speaks to the internal uh, the in-year processes, budget processes that we run. Uh, section 16 is speaking to the uh, use of funds in emergency situations. These should be reported to the Auditor General. So when the Minister of Finance authorizes this, uh, we have to write a report to the Auditor General and explain that this, what we have, uh, what the section 16 was on and so on. Uh, so they have an oversight role there. Uh, doesn't mean that the minister has to ask for um, author approval from the AG in terms of whether they should use those funds or not, but it should be reported. And then section 38, for example, speaks to that all the government institutions uh, financial statements must be audited by the Auditor General. And then there are many other instances within the PFMA itself where institutions are obliged to report or to get concurrence with the AG on certain activities within the public finance management system. Uh, so the, the MFMA is also affected, as I was saying before, uh, the same way as the PFMA. So the role of us in the implementation uh, of, uh, in, in the budget process itself. Uh, so when we design the, the, the budget process, we are obliged to consider the role of the AG in ensuring that our reforms and processes are implemented by the government units. We have to maintain a fine balance uh, because not only will the AG assist us in making sure that uh, the institutions implement, but they also as, assist the other institutions by making sure that whatever we put out there as the treasury can be understood and interpreted the right way. So if there is ambiguity where in what we are saying, we are taken to task by the AG. Uh, so when they do the audits, they also look at uh, the definitions 
for example, in, in classifications, the rules and regulations in how they are interpreted. Uh, so whenever there are those inconsistencies, uh, the Auditor General will, will uh, then uh, request um, responses from the Treasury in terms of that. And, and this has assisted us to sometimes close uh, gaps uh, where they are because of the AG's findings and we have meetings with them and we discuss uh, those findings or those questions. Sometimes, of course, the, the other units say the treasury is the one that did this and that and the Auditor General then uh, investigates that and in, in makes a, fi a, a, a final finding. So they, they, they help us in that sense of giving us uh, a different view, uh, even to make us see that some what how things can be interpreted when they are out there. So usually when we uh, start on a embark on a reform, we already think about the auditability of what we are doing and uh, where it's necessary. We then speak to the auditor general and inform them of the reform. Uh, and, and usually have meetings at a technical level with, with our counterparts at a technical level to see. Uh, how uh, these systems can be can can be um, done the right way. So, so from a, um, in terms of the challenges, I just want to see that I've spoken to this. Right. Okay. In terms of the challenges and opportunities, uh, so from our perspective at a technical level. We have had our disagreements, for example, with the AG in some of their interpretation of our systems and rules and procedures. Um, but then we have a, a, a healthy discourse, I think, uh, in the back and forth, uh, but it provides opportunities for improvement uh, of, of how we articulate things. Um, so if they are auditing and they found that maybe some, uh, some classification was not defined accordingly, because they will often go to the source. If we say uh, the reference is uh, the GFS, for example, the government finance system of the IMF, then they will go and look at the GFS and see whether uh, the interpretation is uh, whatever. So they will always go to the source and, 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 and sometimes that's where uh, we can have disagreements if we feel that they are interpreting uh, that rule, uh, not the way it was intended to. But it's always uh, very beneficial to have that discourse. And then recently, for example, then there are some issues where um, the, the audit would highlight uh, a, 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 um, places of weakness, uh, maybe within the, the treasury and, and our systems. So for example, the COVID-19, emergency where the, the challenge was the responsiveness of National Treasury to ensure that this procurement that happens as quickly as possible uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, but later when the, the Auditor General used its various units to do a multi-pronged audit on the COVID-19 funds, they found that fraudulent activities had occurred. And in their report, they also highlighted that partly it was because of some of some because of loopholes in the emergency measures that we as treasury implemented. Um, so the treasury actually uh, responded swiftly to the findings because we just uh, withdrew uh, the, the emergency measures completely and said, uh, let's just go back to the, to the usual uh, because obviously in the emergency situation, we did not close the loops uh, in terms of that. So those are some of the areas where it becomes useful to have an independent uh, audit, audit, uh, audit institution uh, because they can point to uh, uh, your, your weaknesses without fear, uh, without favor, uh, because they are not worried that the treasury is not going to allocate them funding next year if they don't do this, if they say this or whatever. So they can say pretty much uh, what they see, uh, the way they see it, and we also respond accordingly uh, because we know that uh, they are independent, uh, they have integrity in, in what they say we take seriously. So that's how I view the Auditor General's relationship with us from the uh, view of a budget office within the Treasury. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much to you. Sheila, you, you gave us a deep in, insight to the, the relationship between you, you and, and uh, the, uh, the Auditor General. And it was also uh, a great to observe uh, the reactions of our next speaker, Jan van Schalkwijk, because uh, his body language uh, confirmed uh, what you said about the interference, uh, that's what I believe, that's my opinion, because uh, he was so positive at that moment when you speak about the independence, about the integrity uh, of the institution. So, uh, but now uh, le le let us give uh, him the opportunity to speak and hear directly from, from him. Jan, uh, the floor is yours, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to join you this afternoon. I must admit, it's rather traumatic if you pitch two South Africans directly after each other and you hope and pray that they're going to say the same thing. And Sheila, thanks for, for saying the right things and illustrating that there's this, this symbiotic relationship that, that does exist. I think to the organizers, I, I, I need to recognize the fact that in, in putting together this, you've actually recognized that there's more players than just a Supreme Court institution. Of course, independence of, a, of an audit institution is important, but if other players are not equally strong, um, we've, got, we've got huge problems. So I, I was so glad to hear both Sheila and Amy talking about a strong national treasury. I was so impressed to see that, that also part of this is civil society. And it's when that whole ecosystem works together that, um, that of course, we, we do get something powerful in terms of public finance management. Um, you asked that we introduce ourselves. You've already had my name. Thank God you've got the name perfectly right. In some other countries, it, it gets quite butchered. Um, my name is Jan van Skalpek. I'm part of the executive committee um, of Auditor General of South Africa, working closely with our Auditor General, Tsukani Maluleke. I think she would have loved to have been here this afternoon, so greetings from her. Also got the benefit of um, working very close with, with our colleagues in Intisai, especially the, the IDI. It's good to see a couple of familiar faces from them. Um, we we do the Secretariat for the Intisai Capacity Development Committee. So it's 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 good to see those colleagues um, around here. Um, I think, let me make it very, very short, because I think a lot of the things have been covered. When, when we think about the value add of a Supreme Court institution. Um, there's certain words of our current Auditor General that ring true. She always challenges us that our audit reports must reflect the lived reality of the citizens. And in doing that, contribute to make this better. So if our work does not speak to our citizens, it's really not worth it. Um, and it, it gives you a different context to, to, to think about this, this whole topic that we've got here this afternoon. In living up to her expectations, we really focus on three key areas. There is the area around independence, and I'm so glad that in the initial presentation, we already flagged the, the likes of Intisite P10. That's a real foundation. I mean, I'll come back to that. I think there's, there's two other legs for us that, that, that really also need to play. Um, there's the, the leg of professionalism um, within the Supreme Audit Institution. And in Intisai, we tend to think about it in, in, in four quadrants, and the, the same applies to, to South South Africa. We think about the fact that you've got to have an ideal working environment, not just uh, the independence, but the enabling legislation, the right mandate, um, the right involvement, the right relationship with your, um, your national treasury. Um, wonderful things in the South African context, like being guaranteed a space within the constitution of a country. Um, those are wonderful things in, in working environment. You've got to have credible auditing standards, whether that is the international auditing standards or whether you choose to adopt the international standards of auditing. You need to make sure that you've got competent people um, and proven competent people that can deal with those standards. Um, and then I, I suppose a last element, you've got to have a sanity to, to lead by example and test yourself. You know, we're good as auditors to go out and test other people, but you've got to test yourself. So you also got to step back and say, Am I still as independent as I used to be? Um, am I really adhering to the standards? Am I really producing competent people? Um, so the whole idea of, of measurement, and, and again, our, our colleagues from, from RDI is here, they will quickly point to, to, to the value of a side performance measurement framework to test whether you are still relevant. 
Um, so for us, the first element, independence. Second one, professionalism. The third one, um, into side P12. You're never going to hear a South African speak about anything in public sector auditing without referring to that standard. An interesting standard that challenges us all as public sector auditors, not to just audit, but to audit to the benefit of citizens. So if you've got this obsession with independence, with professionalism and relevance, then we think we're going to go somewhere. Um, I think, Jay, you sort of hinted at the fact earlier on uh, that, that we're very proud that the World Bank recognized that we're doing pretty okay on, on independence. That's good news. We know we're not perfect. Um, it would be interesting to see somebody else have a look at whether we as relevant as we are independent. We think we're doing well, but, uh, but let, me, let me share a couple of reflections with you where, where perhaps we can, we can also be better and, and where we, we've learned certain things from, from our colleagues. Um, you know, when we speak to colleagues, especially in the African context, we, we often get the situation of, um, as soon as I am independent, I will do this and this and this. As soon as I have independence, it almost becomes the blocking angle to executing your job. You know, when, when, when I started working in enterprise circles, and that's, that's the better part of probably 10, 15 years ago, one of my very first involvements was at um, a Commonwealth AG conference in Malta. There was an older gentleman that stood up and he taught us two rules. The rules, first one, a side earn its independence through its relevance. If you start doing the right things, you start adding value, in all probability, your government will recognize you by granting you independence. That's a profound lesson. It means that you get your, your hands dirty and you earn your independence. You don't get independence and then you get your hands dirty. It's quite an important one for us. The other one that we sometimes forget, was remember, independence can also be an easy place to hide. So this older gentleman taught us that the price that a side pays for their independence is its accountability. So when you do have independence, when you do have distance, and um, like Sheila described, we're in a situation where our financial independence is, is quite extreme. You've got to live up to expectation. You've got to play open cards with government and with the public in terms of your strategies and your annual reporting. If you don't do that, you're not accountable and you're not setting the right example. Uh, so for us, these two reasons always ring true when we're in the debate around independence. Earn your independence for your relevance and continue doing that and make sure that you pay your price for independence. That's your own accountability, your ability to lead by example. Um, I think when, when I spoke to our ADI colleagues in preparation for this, they, they specifically asked that we talk about financial independence. And, and it is something that, uh, that we find ourselves in quite a unique situation. I think Sheila already hinted at that. We do not get any government allocation. We charge audit fees like any private audit firm would do. So you spend 100 hours at the auditee, at a specific rate, that's what you charge. And um, so you never looking at a minister of finance with open hands and saying, well, give me money, then I can do. We do the work, we execute, we charge our fees. It works well for us, it works absolutely well for us. There's certain mechanisms that help us to determine how the, the, the rates per hour is determined. After that, it is in a negotiation with the audit committee at, at the entity, um, which is quite robust, sometimes quite intense. Um, but it keeps you on the straight and narrow. It also means that we become effective in the process. Um, without going into a lot of detail, that serves us well. We've seen too many Chapter 9 institutions in our country, these institutions that, um, that Sheila talked about that's there to protect the Constitution, but run into trouble because the moment they get a little bit vocal, government's got the ability to just turn the taps and scale down on the funding. And your efficiency is immediately down and the voice go down. So it works pretty well for us to have that level of independence, that ability to charge fees. It does have drawbacks. Let me be quite honest today. It's got two major drawbacks. The first one is that suddenly you also need to invest in debt management. Not all of your auditees are going to pay you. Um, in, in South African context, especially the municipalities are, are culprits. You can imagine if you're a small little rural municipality that you may have other priorities than paying your auditors. If you're faced with your citizens that want water and electricity, if you've got a choice between paying that or your auditors, you may very well pay those things that would benefit your citizens. And we understand that, but it does sometimes mean that it put pressure on us. So it is a bit of a balancing act. The, the debt management, certainly a challenge. The other part that's, that's also quite interesting and so often challenging is that when you get to discretionary audits, 
you may find yourself in trouble. Um, but that, that government would not be a, necessarily be prepared to pay for that. So we define performance audits, for example, as discretionary audits. So you'd probably find a bit of an argument that say, well, this is discretionary. I prefer not to pay for it. So that's an easy way out. But again, it forces us to think very cleverly about how we position our performance audits. If you can demonstrate the real value add up front, you will get your feet. So I think it's, a, it's an interesting balancing act, it's an extreme form of, of independence, but it forces the right behavior. And, and I think it, it works quite well for us. If you'll allow me just a couple of lessons over the last couple of years. Yes, we're very proud of our independence. And we're very proud of um, the World Bank rating, but there's one rating within there that, that's always given us trouble. And that's the one about the follow up of our recommendations. Um, I'm sure that any of you that look at South Africa know that we don't doing the best job in the world in terms of, of government service, and that our corruption rating is not the best that we would, would want to see it. Um, so we were faced with the option of saying, but we report every year, the report looks the same. If people are not reacting, are you really making a contribution? So first, it forced us to really step back and look at our mandate. And I think that's the thing that we're most proud of is that that we could take government on a journey to reevaluate our mandate. So it goes beyond just the auditing of financial management, like, like um, Sheila described. Um, it, actually, it's financial management and performance management. It now assigns additional powers to us in the sense of referring and binding other investigative bodies to help us do our work. It gives us the power over and above the normal audit recommendation to actually issue binding remedial action. In other words, remedial action that we can legally force down. And in extreme instances, it allows us to issue a certificate of debt to recover money lost. Early days, but believe it or not, we're starting to see that accounting officers take note of these powers and that they're starting to do the right thing. Um, and it was interesting when you introduced me the first time, you didn't use the word Sire of South Africa. I think you used the words Court of South Africa. And we're not the audit court yet, but we're in an interesting situation that we're a financial audit setup but with jurisdictional power. So we're probably a hybrid somewhere in between. But that, in my mind, demonstrates that you go beyond your independence. You're also obsessed with relevance, even to the extent of having to go out and changing your enabling legislation. A last reflection, and then, then I'm done. COVID-19 has learned us all many lessons. Um, same thing here. It was the ultimate test of our relevance. There was a big question mark last year, the run about March, April, when we were all in lockdown, where our Auditor General said, well, who's going to step up? It's got to be us. And we did so. Um, it taught us that there's a thing called real-time audit. In other words, um, as the expenditure happened, you're out there auditing and you're giving feedback. It's not a year down the line post the fact where nobody can take any action. We literally worked in three-month chunks. And we've learned interesting terminology. So real-time audit was the first one, and I suppose it's an obvious one. Now, here the community is using it quite often nowadays, gives you two additional advantages. It gives you real-time reporting. So Parliament and Treasury knows about this real-time. It gives you real-time oversight, and it gives you real-time reaction. So you can fix things. Sheila hinted at the fact that very quickly, early on in the crisis, around about June, July last year, Treasury could already take the first steps in saying, hang on, this guidance is not going to serve us. Let's do something different. Where we had payments to help the poor, they could intervene and make sure that that process is redirected. So that was already a big lesson in terms of relevance, the fact that you could discover new things. We learned about proactive tools. Somewhere during the course of a year, we issued a guide on preventative controls to try and help organizations to proactively fix certain things before we get there for audit. There's no sense in the fact that we catch them out much better if we can empower them to actually fix this problem before it, before it arises. We've learned a lot about integration of teams, um, making sure that your investigation, your, your investigation unit, your financial auditors, your performance auditors work together in one team. You get fantastic results. You become quite creative. We've learned a lot about relationships, um, especially with other investigative bodies. Suddenly we're a team where in the past we may have competed, then you'll be, be very glad to, to, to hear that we, we flag our relationship with civil society as one of the key enablers. Um, wonderful. It, it, it really worked wonders. 
And we, we may have feared civil society before we now know that these are our parties that we really want to get to the citizens. So new relationships as, as, as well. Um, I think that's probably where I need to, to, to stop, but let me, let me conclude by just reminding you of those three pillars that, that I talked about. is independence, there's professionalism as well, and there's an obsession with relevance. If you can crack that game and you can partner creatively with a bigger accounting system in your, in your country, you should see success. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, great being uh, hearing you, all the good uh, news that you presented, especially this one, the seeing COVID as an opportunity to, to reinvent uh, a part of your audits, uh, uh, going faster, uh, practically uh, in, a, in a no time. You said three months, if I understood correctly. Uh, which is amazing, uh, give, giving everybody the, the detailed information uh, as, as it was presented. And uh, yeah, and also it was very important to, to hear uh, uh, this special model of financing of your institution, which gives, us, gives you a, a, a special level uh, of independence uh, in, in this uh, financial uh, perspective. And I was also very glad to, to hear uh, that, that you went uh, inside and uh, try to think over uh, what is actually the purpose of your institution and that you basically reinvented uh, some, some, uh, some uh, uh, new meaning uh, uh, and the ways of acting. And uh, it was really great. Uh, it gives me a, a, a couple of ideas for, for my institution. Thank you very much. And uh, now, um, uh, I would like to, to invite our, our last speaker, um, Katarina uh, Guntzadze from the Minister of Finance of Georgia. Uh, the floor is yours. You're welcome. Very late. Good evening from Georgia and uh, happy 10th anniversary to gifts. Uh, I'll try to be brief since this uh, section already took quite long. Uh, so many things was said about the independence of the state audit institution. Of course, we signed up for every word already said. Again, I represent the budget department of the Ministry of Finance, that hence the institution who is being audited, whose work is being audited regularly. Uh, so I would focus uh, to one more challenge, which maybe was not that much mentioned, and. Uh, was really a challenge and an issue for a country like Georgia, post-Soviet countries, and maybe some other countries as well, where we had to face both sides to the new, new, uh, new public institution building when the not chamber of control had not, we are not to be acted and then seen as the inspectors and the controllers, but rather than auditors. So even myself being almost the same age as the independence Georgia, I had to also face some representatives of the state audit institute who would act like prosecutors when coming for the audit session. So that was a process which we uh, both sides, the government and the state audit institution have undergone uh, together since the independence when we were building new public finance management system in the uh, country for the last uh, 30 years, so to say. So the, uh, as I know some of other Soviet countries, post-Soviet countries, this, uh, this challenge of seeing the auditors uh, not as the inspectors, not as the controllers, uh, and also them acting as auditors and not inspectors and controllers, is still an issue. So I would like to uh, mention one of those challenges that we might have faced, which is not very familiar maybe to other members of this uh, session uh, today. Uh, otherwise, what was said about the independence uh, and um, of the uh, state audit in Georgia as well, it is guaranteed by legislation. There is an organic law which regulates the state audit institute. The general auditor is uh, uh, elected by the parliament for five year term. Uh, and so he's completely independent from the government. Uh, the budgeting process uh, is also independent from the government. There are only few institutions, including the parliament itself, state audit institute and central election committee who get their financing done themselves. And we just 
put it in our budget figures as given, and they are approved by the parliament without interference from the government side. Uh, the salaries are also regulated differently. The auditor's salaries are uh, exception uh, from the general rule. So in general, they get much higher salaries than the public servants uh, would get. Uh, as for uh, the process of auditing the budget, annual budget and um, uh, annual budget performance reports, uh, of course, they, they, they uh, write the reports on every annual budget submission. And when we do the update of the annual budget submission to the parliament, it is obligatory that we also provide a matrix to the parliament where we comment on uh, how we reacted on the comments of the State Audit Institute. Uh, and as for the annual budget performance report, when we finalize the annual budget performance report, we first submit it to, to the State Audit Institution. Uh, and uh, when the State Audit is done with the uh, report on our annual budget performance report, this is when we submit it to the uh, parliament together. Uh, and also it is obligatory that we ever annually do the action plan on complying with the recommendations of the uh, state audit on our annual budget report uh, performance. And all, every year when we submit the annual budget performance to the parliament, we also submit a uh, report where we uh, describe how we complied with the previous uh, year's uh, recommendations. Uh, so at this point, um, we really, the both sides, the state audit and uh, the Ministry of Finance feel the part of, to be the stakeholders and parts of the one and the same process acting with the, within the same goals. Uh, we have the PFM Council set up, um, we, which is an interagency council, includes the Ministry of Finance, uh, Parliament, State Audit Institute, and this is the council who uh, leads the PFM reform in general uh, in Georgia, and the action plans and strategies are also done together. So I would say the communication is very active, and we really feel like we are cooperate, cooperating with one another uh, during this process. Uh, and uh, we, of course, acknowledge that their, their role is very crucial. Uh, just to give an example, every time the state audit submits their report, this is when it attracts the audience. Though they are reporting against, the against those uh, data and facts which we've disclosed in the annual budget or annual budget performance report, when they get the audience, when they, when, when, when they get uh, attract the audience, it's really after this uh, audit report was also disclosed. Uh, the role is really crucial. And so then, then we guide our future plans uh, based on those uh, recommendations. Um, our State Audit Institute also on public participation has provided, has, has implemented a budget monitor, which shows a real time, uh, real time information on budget performance. And the source for that budget monitor is our treasury, of course, the Ministry of Finance. So this is what also one of the signs signs how, how actively we cooperate on a daily basis uh, to have this uh, system um, available for the public. So I really tried to be very brief, not to take uh, a lot of your time. So hopefully it was. Uh, Thank you very much, Ekaterina. And now uh, we are at the point where we have heard all the responders. And uh, according to Benjamin, as we discussed it before, uh, I believe now we are going to open the floor to the public. Sorry, sorry, uh, uh, George, but I think that uh, since we have had very interesting uh, participations from all our uh, respondents, I think that we are uh, mostly running out of time and uh, since we are we are we are reaching almost half an hour of the session it has been very interesting maybe maybe if you want to to close the session with some some uh, some uh, remarks or 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 if if if, if there, there there can be a, an opportunity to to have questions i i would like only if you if you allow me George, to, to to yes of to, course to raise a question you're uh, welcome yeah to raise a question specifically to to joaquin uh, one of our of our first uh, participants in From the Argentina, session. Yes, From Argentina. Yes, I don't know if he's still there. Yeah, he is. He is. He's here. Yes. Yeah. Yes, Joaquin, he's, he, His mic is off. 
Okay, so just one question, Joaquin. You mentioned about that uh, in the Latin American regional assets regions, it was clearly that some supreme institutions were inclined to, to have the, a relationship with civil society organizations and others were reluctant to do so. But my, my question would be, uh, is there any pattern regarding the institutional uh, uh, characteristics of the supremo institutions or the national context that you can find uh, as to when the supremo institutions are inclined to to be to be engaged. Uh... Uh, may I thank you for your question. May uh -huh. I uh, suggest uh, as as Jorg kindly offered. Uh, and uh, taking into consideration that we have little time, but since we have little time, but yet you kindly raised the question, Benjamin, and it is your right. Let me follow uh, York's uh, uh, suggestion that we open up for one or two more questions, and uh, then people have the time to respond. And even if we close 10 minutes late, we can survive. I know for those of you who have to leave, we understand. So for those of you who can stay, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, Juan Pablo, I, I agree with this idea. Uh, the time should, should not be our constraint. Uh, let, let's take it as much as we can. And uh, of course, if somebody has to leave, uh, feel free to do so. And uh, is there anybody who would like to, to give a couple uh, of more questions? Uh, otherwise, I, I would suggest that we focus on the, this main uh, fil rouge that was actually going through the whole session, uh, the financial independence of the institution, of the Supreme Audit institutions. Um, what, what would be the best way to, to ensure uh, the, 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 the much possible financial independence we have heard uh, it, it should be um, uh, in organic law or in the constitution, uh, um, uh, the legal uh, uh, frame uh, be set for, for the independence of, of the Supreme Audit Institution. Then we, we heard about the, 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 the integrity of, of the people uh, working at the Supreme Audit Institutions. Um, uh, that that uh, financial process, uh, we heard about that. And um, maybe we should discuss it um, uh, through, especially in this little uh, frame of, of the process of finance of, of, of Supreme Audit institutions, uh, the process of adopting the budget of, of any of your countries. Because uh, that's where um, the, the, these things are happening. And uh, maybe I should start with an example from, from our country. Um, every year we have a discussion um, about our budget with the Ministry of Finance. And uh, in our legal framework gives us also the opportunity if we don't reach the agreement with the Minister of Finance, that we can go directly to the parliament. But uh, ever since uh, we exist for the past 25 years, uh, we always reach the agreement with the Minister of Finance. Uh, looks like we are another one of the institutions that has a very good cooperation with the Minister of Finance. Uh, but nevertheless, um, um, the legal framework is there. Uh, if there would uh, be um, any case that we would be under pressure from, from the executive power, that we will be not able to, to reach the agreement, uh, we, we can always go to the parliament. Uh, th this is the example from, from, from our country. Thank you. Uh, otherwise, if uh, you don't have any any other questions, uh, maybe Joaquin, you, you can answer uh, the questions that uh, the Benjamin gave you. Yes, definitely. I will be very brief. Thank you. Uh, that'll be my answer. Um, well, I, I think Benjamin freezed for a moment, but I think I got the answer uh, completely. Um, We've been discussing regarding uh, in, the, in the situation, the frame of OLASEF, uh, which are the, the practices that Supreme Court institutions should conduct regarding public participation in, in Latin America. And it's been pretty much of a challenge. 
I would say that most of them at this point already have some kind of public policy regarding uh, public participation within the auditing process, but there is still a, a very varying degree of intensity and extension of these practices. And some of these institutions are still reluctant, for example, to include public participation during the audit process uh, while the auditing is being conducted, and also with regard to the following of recommendations made to public institutions. Some of them are simply including the voice of people uh, when they are planning auditing, just receiving uh, maybe some inputs or proposals on, on, on what they should be on what they should be auditing um, in future uh, auditing plans on, on, on whatsoever. And what we're trying to do at least as a civil society organization is on one hand, pursuing a, a series of capacity building activities to raise awareness of the importance of including civil participation along all the cycle of, of auditing. That, that, that is, I think, mainly one of the, the main challenges. And regarding to what I said during my, my, my opportunity of, of, of holding the, 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 the microphone, uh, I think that we should also be discussing how we can include um, public participation in other areas uh, of the functioning of supreme audit institutions, such as, for example, the the, the period when they they allocate a, a certain uh, area, a certain group of public officials to uh, determine what which is the budget they are going to request to the to the legislature to operate in the in the following years. So we are trying to be creative and imaginative about the, the new channels of public participation within public uh, supreme audit institutions because, and this is my closing remark, uh, because. We are observing that uh, supreme audit institutions in Latin America are facing many limitations in terms of the impact on the work of other public institutions. And we believe, and we strongly believe, that the way to surpass this, to overcome these challenges, is by including the, the citizenship to empower them with the conclusion of, of informs and, and the results of the auditing process. Uh, thank you, Joaquin. Uh, may, maybe this is some suggestion to Claire. Uh, Claire from IBP, have you heard the suggestions? Uh, I've been following the, the questionnaires of uh, IBP for years, and I see the involvement uh, of the idea of participation of, of the citizens uh, through the whole cycle of budget and auditing being a part of the budgetary cycle. And uh, maybe in your next questionnaire, you, you will include also these ideas uh, uh, of not just uh, participation of citizens in, in um, preparing the plan of the audits, uh, uh, the allocation of, of audit teams uh, through the year, but maybe also uh, some kind of, kind of participation in, in monitoring of the quality of the audit work. Uh, it, it's basically the question, who audits the auditor? Can, can... Yeah, no, thank you so much. And, and it's, it's great to see, thank you for <laughs> delving into the open budget survey. This is, we're getting a lot more attention to these very questions. And of course we look at extent to which the public can participate in audit planning and audit investigations and audit follow-up. Our audit accountability initiative is, is very much testing that idea that when SAIs and the public and civil society can work together, we can enhance the responsiveness of government to those audits. And we've been learning great examples from, from, from the US and the way they, they track remedial actions in Georgia, many of the colleagues here. And of course, in South Africa, where colleagues, as Jan was highlighting, they've been working very closely with the INTESI, as part of the INTESI Capacity Building Committee on stakeholder engagement, how, and a framework, there's a framework now on, on how SAIs can enhance that engagement in the civil society and, and citizens. So all this to say that we're very excited about this and, and we have some indicators now that, that measure that very participation, of course, based on INTESI and, and GIFs work of course as well and, and are keen to bring SAIs more into this process. So 
how can we work together on, on looking at mechanisms for citizen input, public engagement in audit planning, in the investigations, in the follow-up, ensuring that, that governments ultimately take action on audit. So great examples from, from Argentina where not only do they collect the inputs as they plan the audits, but provide the feedback on which inputs are taken into account as you were highlighting earlier through to participatory audits in the Philippines, of course, through to great examples of, of follow-up in, in many countries. So we're happy to, to share these examples. We're happy to build resources together. These are some of the conversations that are happening now, sharing these case studies, and of course, building that critical mass of institutions that are committed to this agenda and, and working together to strengthen public participation. So very happy to, to continue this conversation together. Thank you. So uh, basically we come to the end, I guess. Uh, some people have already left us. Uh, I, I would really sincerely thank uh, GIFT for organizing this meeting. It was great to hear uh, from all participants, uh, from all presenters uh, about the experience, about the cooperation, about the ideas, about the reinventions. And I sincerely thank everybody uh, for, for, for your presentations. And uh, um, let, let, let me finish it uh, that I hope that, that next time uh, we will be out of this uh, COVID crisis and that we will, that we will meet in person. Uh, th this is a small wish I have because uh, yes, it, it's nice to see you on the screen, but it, it's something completely different uh, to, to have you across the table, uh, to watch you directly in your eyes, to see your body language, your reactions. Uh, this gives you much more the impression about the people that you, you, you talk to. And so let, let us really sincerely hope that sooner or later we, we will be able to travel and, and meet each other in person. And with this, I, I, I conclude and uh, I, I give my final words to, to Juan Pablo just to thank you very much that wish is well um, uh, shared by all of you and uh, we will not only meet soon in person hopefully next year uh, but we will also as you said uh, see each other and uh, hug each other we need it thank you yes thank you so thank you very much to all uh Goodbye, enjoy uh, the rest of the days of August and have a nice September and uh, all, all the way around that we see next year. God bless you all. Bye. Thank you.